Welcome everyone to the ANFF webinar series. Um, as always on a Wednesday afternoon, we have collected the best and the brightest from the ANFF network to join us to talk about some of the incredible work that ANFF enables in Australia. Um, this webinar series has come from the fact that we can't all get together and do this in person in a very large workshop where we celebrate as much science as possible in the one day. We are hoping to do that in the near future in May uh, in Melbourne. So we hope that those of you who are interested in what ANFF does support around the country will join us in Melbourne in May um, and we can do this all in person. Um, as these webinars have been going, we will be using the Q&A function um, on your webinar. So please just have a look down the bottom of your screen. You should find a Q&A function. So please ask the questions there and I will pass those over to our speakers as we go at the end of their talks. Um, as you've probably just seen, um, uh, we are being recorded. So um, please be aware of that. So when you are sending anything through, um, and I'd also like, before we get started, to acknowledge the sponsors that we have for both the ANFF showcase and have stayed on board to support this particular webinar series. So our sponsors are um, a valuable part of the ANFF network. We work them, with them quite closely when we're talking about providing uh, new services, seminars, education and tools to our, um, to our users out there. So we do thank our sponsors for being involved in these, um, this webinar series. So this is the third set of webinars that we have done and this one is based on space and defense and I have two incredible speakers that are going to, to talk about those particular areas and how they relate to ANFF from the enabled science. Our first speaker is Professor Craig Priest from University of South Australia. Craig is also a Deputy Director of our South Australian Node. Um, and has been working very closely in a number of areas related to space science in the, in the recent past. So I'll pass over to Craig to allow him to tell you all about his wonderful work rather than me trying to um, par paraphrase it in, 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 in advance. So over to you, Craig. Thanks very much, Jane. I'm sure you do a wonderful job, uh, but let's, let's see if I can uh, uh, connect and uh, talk about the research. Hopefully this is working, just a sec. Let's see. So hopefully you've got my, my slide. Um, it's, it's great to have the chance to uh, talk to you um, about some, some of the uh, space uh, technology that we've, we've been uh, uh, and research that we've been working on. And uh, it's obviously a pretty exciting time for space in uh, space research in Australia and space industry. And uh, so this is a pretty, pretty timely uh, webinar. So thanks to ANFF. Um, the, the title of my slide is, uh, of my talk is Nanofabrication for Out of This World Applications. I guess it's a, a tad corny and I'll, I'll blame Tom a little bit for that, but uh, it's, it's the reality that uh, nano devices are not only useful here on Earth, but are going to find their way uh, into space applications and on our moon and other planets. And see if this works, yes. So just a little bit of background for me. I'm the director of the um, South Australian node of the Australian National Fabrication Facility. So based down here in, uh, in Adelaide. And we have a lot of different capabilities around lithography and bonding, including glass bonding for uh, certain uh, types of chips, including microfluidic devices. We've got uh, etching and coding capabilities, prototyping, including some exquisite micro machining, uh, as well as characterization and, and nano uh, structuring and patterning. Um, we make a lot of devices, um, but what's critically important to, to our uh, role really within the research ecosystem is to be able to support a lot of research projects. And so um, we, we've been pretty successful in doing that and connecting people with industry. Um, the uh, strategic uh, engagement and alignment uh, role for ANFF is pretty exciting. And, uh, and I know that you, you don't want me to talk only about ANFF. This is just a couple of slides just to, on background, but we've been able to connect in with the Defence Science and Technology Group. Uh, we um, work together on some devices and we share infrastructure on selected um, activities. We also have engagement with large companies like Allvac uh, and through ANFF have connected in um, with NASA. We also support fundamental research. It doesn't just have to be industry engaged and congratulations to Justin Chalker with the uh, uh, 2020 Prime Minister's Prize for Science and the New Innovators category. It's really exciting. 
And we've jumped in to uh, play our part in the COVID crisis, um, dealing with uh, some PPE uh, um, testing, support for testing. So what are nano devices are typically thought of as small things. And traditionally people say small things amuse small minds, but hopefully I can convince you that actually there are quite a few big minds trying to uh, be amused by small things. Um, and particularly in these applications in defense and, science and, and space. Um, these are a few of the small things that you might see made at our node. And uh, the, these colors you see here are due to some nanostructuring. Uh, it, there's an optical um, effect here. We have microelectrodes and, uh, and microfluidic devices, as well as various types of cuvettes and lab on a chip technologies. But this one here is actually two little devices sitting uh, on a $2 coin and you can see the size are really, really small. So these are, have some internal structures as well. And uh, they're the size of a, a star on the $2 coin. And so the micro machining capability is really um, quite, something quite special. And if you need that, please talk to our node. But what about small things in big places? And the biggest place of all, of course, is space. Um, so small things, uh, nano devices are finding their way here on earth. How about in big places? Well, I want to talk to you a little bit about some of the work that we've been doing with micro and nano devices uh, that relates to, to space. So the first question I want to ask us is what, do, what does space and micro and nano environments have in common? So when you think about um, bulk scale materials, uh, particularly in the, in the case of fluidics, which I'm talking about a bit today, these uh, waves you see here are on the scale of meters. They're turbulent, there's spray as well as uh, connected water. It's um, stirred and, and there's uh, a lot of energy involved. But as you scale down, you get to this millimeter scale, things look a little bit more quiescent. It's quite beautiful seeing these droplets splash. And if you go further down again, like this little bug in the morning dew, um, things start to get a bit weird. And in this case, this bug is covered with little tiny droplets. It's probably uh, a bit fed up with the morning dew, wants uh, the spring to come perhaps, I don't know. Uh, and it's unable to really shake them off and it's gonna have to wait for them to evaporate. And what I wanna do is now draw this connection by using a, a YouTube video from astronaut um, Chris Hadfield from the Canadian Space Agency. This is an, an example where uh, you perhaps start to see some of this micro behavior, like you start to feel like the bug uh, if you're an astronaut. Let's take a quick look at this. He's gonna show us what happens when you wet and try and wring out a uh, washcloth. Uh, and so first he's gonna fill it up with this water from the bag. It's going horizontal, of course, there's okay. no gravity. So you see here, the water is now, as he says, all over his hands. Uh, it's moved um, from, I mean, it's still in the sponge, but it's also on his fingertips. You can see the shine there. And uh, it reminded me of uh, this bug, but also of, of a quote from an astronaut. Who had been, oh, sorry, we'll try and skip through that for the end. Um, astronaut Mike Hopkins, uh, who was on the ISS, in, from 2013 and 2014 said that when he was exercising in space, he really missed being able to have a shower. He said, up there, the sweat sticks to you. You have pools of sweat on your arms, your head, around your eyes, and once in a while, a glob of it will go flying off. So it paints you a picture like uh, uh, that the micro scale experience of this bug suddenly becomes a macro scale. And the reason for that is the, the force of the, the, the gravitational um, force is now uh, negligible compared to the interfacial forces that are acting. 
And so I'll try and get through the next slide. There we go. And so my research interest is really what can we, uh, what can we understand about these thin films and drops and bubbles and micro nanofluidics and tailored materials and interfaces, those interfacial phenomena, what can we understand about them to be able to exploit them in devices? And typically I'm looking at sampling and reactions and separations and uh, various sensing uh, devices. And you can see here in this slide, several of the uh, different types of devices we have. But there are other things you have to consider for space um, industry and space travel. And that is, of course, the mass of uh, the hardware that you're taking up uh, into orbit or beyond. Uh, it's to get to low Earth orbit, it currently costs somewhere between a thousand and two, roughly around a thousand dollars to per gram to, to launch with the Falcon Heavy. Um, the, uh, the Falcon 9 is about twice that. So it's coming down, but it's very expensive to send anything to space. And so you've got to consider how heavy it is. You also need to consider the size. You obviously don't have much space. Um, it's not like your garage. You can't just fill it up with junk uh, in, in the ISS. And so you need to conserve that. And so here's, a, here's an image of a, uh, not one of ours, but um, from Co et al. Um, this is a sweat sensor that can, handle uh, chloride, lactate, pH, and glucose. It's small, it's uh, um, wearable, um, and so quite convenient in that sense, non-invasive. But there's a third aspect is really lifetime. And you could think about this as uptime or longevity or continuous monitoring versus single use. And so here I joke around saying, you know, did you remember to take out the trash? But the reality is you don't want to have trash accumulated during space flight. And so if you extrapolate this, maybe you need one device to do a measurement over an hour. If you're now traveling for 300 days and you need to measure three times a day, suddenly you need a thousand devices instead of one. And so how long can we make these devices last for is a, is a significant factor to consider. So a couple of um, examples, I'm gonna talk a little bit about some life support uh, um, work that we did with the University of Puerto Rico. I'll touch on mining and manufacturing. And these two I won't talk about today, but the Astronaut Health Monitoring is a new project um, through the ANFF umbrella and the satellite hardware is something, a bit of a new adventure that we're going on. But this is generally the spaces that I'm working in at the moment. The life support um, collaboration, I think it's important to reflect on how these collaborations have come about. There was an emerging technology meeting in Washington DC with uh, the uh, many different agencies in the US as well as in Australia present. Um, and it led to discussions with the University of Puerto Rico and then to an AAS travel grant for me to go and visit them. And uh, that led to really good discussions and ultimately a microgravity flight, which is the journey I'll take you through in the next few slides. So Professor Carlos Cabrera at uh, the NASA Center for Nanoscale Materials at University of Puerto Rico He's a fantastic researcher. He's got a wonderful group there, an expert on uh, electrochemistry and nanomaterials. And he was looking and still is looking at how we can uh, recycle waste to get back the good, the good bits that we want. And in their work, they're actually looking at uh, astronaut waste. So being able to take urine, uh, convert it to um, ammonia rich solution and then convert that electrochemically to energy uh, and nitrogen and water. And you can see this is a, um, a, a bit of an overview of some electrochemistry and it's not important to go into detail, but you can see water is coming out here and electrons, which is where we get uh, this great opportunity to recycle and recover those valuable resources. But you can also see that there's a bit of nitrogen. So there's gas being formed here. And there's a, there was a big question about what happens like when you, uh, to, this, to the gas that's formed, it can be absorbed or it can be gaseous um, in zero gravity. And so they've done some experiments already in zero G or microgravity. Uh, and what they saw here with this NH3 oxidative was a 20 to 65% reduction in ammonia oxidation current in micro G compared to, uh, to, compared to ground. And so they were wondering what exactly was for causing this. And, uh, and we got discussing uh, about the reasons for it. And what I show you on the right hand side here is, is not from the same group, but it's water electrolysis. And you can see that the, um, there's, there's one G here. So this is 
just like uh, on the left, and microgravity on the right. And what you can see very clearly is that bubbles are accumulating in microgravity at the surface of the electrode, which is effectively fouling the uh, electrode and making uh, the, and slowing down that uh, the electrochemical conversion. And so the zero gravity takes out the buoyancy and then suddenly you've got a problem with moving the gas away from the, the surface. So we wondered, well, how can we get rid of these bubbles in zero gravity? And at the time I was working, and still am to some degree, working on uh, structured surfaces to control wettability. And we had been taking advantage of capillarity, which is what uh, we exploit or plants exploit here in these flowers or in, through soil water, drainage through soil, as well as some sponges and paper towel, which we're all very familiar with. This is capillarity that can move water into microstructured hydrophilic materials. But on the flip side, this is also moving air out. And so on the top right, I'll show you what happens when we take a droplet and put it onto one of these micro pillar arrays. You can see a sound image there. And you'll see this tiny droplet spreads out into a perfect film. Now this film is exactly the height of the pillars. It fills interstitial spaces. It's square when you look from above and is um, perfectly um, filled there, displacing the air. And down below, I have another image which shows you the thin film wicking out from the edge of the droplet uh, until you get that perfect film that you see in the bottom. And so by doing that, we thought, well, if we can uh, drive out air by wicking, why can't we drive it out from a microelectrode uh, as well? And we first do some of the theory on the left here. We see um, the height of the pillars. You can ignore some, these are dimensionless units, but the height of the pillars is increasing up the uh, y-axis and the width of the pillars, or I should say the coverage of the pillars is increasing towards the right. And so you get this blue shaded area here where wicking is occurring and outside wicking is not occurring. So essentially, in the blue zone, we, can, we should be able to push out these bubbles spontaneously. For circular pillars, it's slightly different due to the geometry involved and you've got a bit more area, so we ended up using circular pillars. And here is the, on the right is the concept. The hypothesis is the flat electrode will accumulate the bubbles. The structured electrode will perhaps counterintuitively, if, if you think about it, um, push out these, these bubbles. So going a little bit further, we could simulate this with uh, help from um, some good colleagues at the uh, Max Planck Institute for Dynamics and Self-Organization, uh, Dr. Chiro Semprabon and uh, Martin Bringman. And what you see here is now the normalized volume increasing to the right and Z here is the position, the Z position, so that as you go up, the, this is the mean Z position. So as you go up, the, the bubble is pushing its way out. Now, um, what this on the right, we show a, a, an illustration of this. This is not a droplet of water. It looks like it, but it's actually the reverse. This is now your bubble and it's growing, stuck inside the pillars. And at some point it gets pushed out to be able to refresh the surface, which is great in simulations, but when you actually look at the real case, you see exactly the same thing. This is the first bubble forming, it grows, it grows, it grows. Now you don't see it pushed out here in frame G, but in frame H, you've got evidence that it has been pushed out because you see a new individual bubble forming below. And then it coalesces with the bubble above and this cycle repeats. So we thought, well, why don't we try and use these microstructured electrodes to improve the efficiency of the experiment, uh, the, the uh, life support, um, recovery of energy and water uh, with using ammonia. So uh, I was very fortunate to um, join the University of Puerto Rico team on one of their uh, microgravity experiment ca campaigns. This is a parabolic flight experiment. This is, the, this is the, the plane here and the team. There were many people who had their experiments uh, simultaneously uh, way back in 2014. And, uh, just a bit of a shout out here to, of course, um, uh, Professor Cabrera, who, as I say, is, is really leading this work and I was fortunate to work with him. This is uh, Camila um, and Eduardo and Raul, and there was uh, some others in the team too, but you can see them floating around in this micro-G flight. 
the parabola gives you a very short amount of time uh, of zero g. So this is uh, the gravitational acceleration on the left, and this is the, the time in between this, uh, this parabola. So as you, uh, as you go over the top of the parabola, you get a little bit of time to do your experiments, and then you repeat this over and over again. Uh, this is the experimental setup up the top right. And it works. So here I show the experimental results from those flights and uh, what you can see is the, the, the color coded. So for the red is the flat surface, the green is shorter pillars, uh, and then the um, blue is the, the, the taller pillars. And it turns out that, as I said before, the aspect ratio is important. So when you have short pillars, you can actually, actually capture the air more efficiently uh, than when you've got taller uh, pillars, which will push it out more easily. And, what we see is in fact not much happening for the, the flat and the short pillars, but then a significant uh, oxidation peak for the uh, tall pillars, which is um, pretty exciting to, to see. So we're able to demonstrate this uh, spontaneous release of bubbles uh, can, be, um, su can support the uh, efficiency of this uh, technique in microgravity. And it wouldn't matter if it's upside down or experiencing two Gs or one G or zero G, it still will work. So just switching gears, I want to say a little bit about mining and manufacturing, and you'll see why in a moment. But um, this is an area I've been doing a lot of things on Earth about, uh, and there's not a lot of mining and manufacturing in space at the moment, but it's coming. And so it's pretty important to uh, be able to have a look at, um, at, the, uh, at the, um, what, what we can do in the future. So just a couple of quick slides on what we've been doing. Uh, for quite a few years, we've been working on uh, miniaturizing extraction. And here you can see uh, our microfluidic chip, and it's a multi-layer chip, something that we specialized, uh, glass chips, um, which are multi-layer spe specialty of our node, and uh, in borosilicate glass. And we have 245 aqueous and organic streams. We can tune the phase ratio, we can tune the contact time, and we use two solvents, so aqueous and organic are contacting in this zone here, the extraction takes place and then we're able to recover and repeat. Now what you see on the right is what happens when we take a chip like this and turn it into a factory. So on the right hand side, you have a uh, three stage, three -stage counter-current uh, solvent extraction and uh, with the pumping of the aqueous and the organic behind. And this can do one litre per hour, which for, um, for some extraction processes isn't very much, but when you go to high value, high concentration materials is actually um, quite a, a good a target to, to, to meet. And so with that in our laboratory for rare earths, for platinum, uh, for palladium, and a number of other metals, uh, which has been um, really exciting and on a very small footprint compared to the conventional case. The second example here is leaching. So this is, uh, I probably should have shown these slides in the opposite order, uh, usually you leach first, then extract. Uh, but leaching here, we're taking just 50 milligrams of uh, ore and putting it into this microfluidic device, which has an inbuilt filter. And we're able to track over time the release of valuable material from that. We've just published this in Environmental Science Technology. The application was for, um, for um, uh, acid mine drainage uh, into the environment. Um, and What's nice though, is this is a very small amount and we can start to screen parameters without having to use much material. This is a five uh, nest um, uh, leaching unit. And here you can see this red data, we're, we're screening um, the iron concentration uh, for a given temperature uh, and uh, we get the pirate dissolution rate increasing and we can screen these parameters. So you may say these are both terrestrial why would we be interested in doing this uh, in space? Well, in the news recently, you may have heard that there's an, a, a Cirrus Rex um, uh, mission going on that has just collected, uh, it was supposed to collect just a little bit of sample, but it, in the news it's saying, may have collected a lot, a kilogram of asteroid from asteroid Bennu, um, but it's currently 330 million kilometers from Earth at the moment. And, it won't be back till 2023. And so for us to know what it's collected, it's going to take years. For the, and so the more analysis and uh, processing and manufacturing we can do in space, the better. And I think that these micro systems for, for extraction, uh, whether it's leaching or solvent extraction or other 
um, processing of valuable materials is going to become increasingly important. So small things are going into big places. But I want to find, finish very briefly with the answer to why now? And I'll just flick through this quite quickly because we don't have a lot of time. But it's not often that you get, I was going to say a perfect storm, but it's usually a negative connotation. So let's say planets aligning, excuse any puns, um, academics and the agencies and the government and industry all on the same page, all on the same mission. And so we're very lucky here in Australia that over the last few years, we've had the establishment of the Australian Space Agency. We've had um, the star shots be announced, uh, the Defence Science and Technology Group, uh, one of them is Resilient Multi-Mission Space. We have SmartSat CRC, which is targeting a, a huge growth market in space industry with all these companies on board on the right-hand side. We've had a, a major international space um, conference uh, with 4,500 4, delegates in South Australia in recent years. And we have things like the Space Forum to foster collaboration, which um, is uh, overseen by the South Australian space industry, or at least supported by SAIC. And a shout out to them for their good work in South Australia. We also have major international partnerships, and this is a plug for the Australian National Fabrications efforts in this. Um, they've got an agreement, an umbrella agreement with NASA to uh, leverage respective strengths and explore future needs in advanced materials, micro nanoelectronics, sensors, medical devices, and photonics. So a really exciting development step that will open uh, the doors for more research between Australian researchers and uh, NASA. The first annex is the new Centers for Biological Health Monitoring, which is an exciting development. Finally, I want to uh, just acknowledge that the, the Venture Catalyst Space Program here in South Australia is, has been um, uh, kicking goals, let's say. These are the companies that have been established. This one here is in fact one of mine, which is why I want to plug them. They have uh, given uh, uh, a great support in terms of workshops and mentoring funding, uh, access to industry exports and the community. And why would I talk about startups a little bit? We had our recent microengineering winter school uh, in, in spring, in September, because of COVID. The first question from a student in the audience was, I've always been interested in space uh, and space research, and I, I want to find out how I can you know, get into space industry and start a company. And uh, we have now these vehicles for those sorts of aspirations. And so I'd just encourage you, if that's your dream, then now's a really good time to go for it. Um, if you don't know where to start, there's a great report by NASA, 239 pages to read, but it's good reading. Uh, 17 technology areas that are priorities for them. And uh, finally, I just want to thank all the people who have contributed to making this research and these relationships with uh, different agencies um, possible. Um, I want to uh, you know, thank all the students who've worked hard in the experiments and the ANFF team for facilitating this. And, and thank you also for listening to me today. Well, thank you very much, Craig. And uh, it's actually quite um, amusing. You, the announcement for the NASA agreement went up a year today. It's our anniversary. <laughs> so a year working on that one. So that's been a very a fruitful year on that one as well. So I would encourage anybody to drop a question. I have time for one question for Craig. And if nobody want, has one, it's going to be mine. Ah. So it is. Uh, Craig, so we're talking about space, we're talking about um, how fabrication technology needs to go to space. What are the differences in making something for space compared to making something for an Earth-based application? Mm. Yeah, I, I mentioned about size and mass and, uh, you know, re but reliability um, is, is critical. I think... Um, there's a lot of proof of concept research that has, you know, sticky tape and super glue in the lab and you can publish the paper and that that's fine, but you don't want to send your sticky tape and super glue into, into orbit and rely on it. Um, and I think that's where ANFF has a really uh, clear role is to take those ideas and concepts that are, are new uh, and exciting, but take them further so that um, we can have proof of manufacturing uh, that we can um, demonstrate the reliability, uh, we can get that high level of QA uh, in these devices and, and build some um, confidence that, that these will be resilient in space. 
Um, you know, failure is not an option, as they say. Uh, and so when it comes to our research, we have to make sure that we're not, uh, you know, we, we have to take it further, I think, than you would otherwise do with your discovery grant or your uh, academic um, lab work. All right. Well, thank you very much, Craig. Um, I do notice there's another couple of questions there. We'll take them offline and we'll ask Craig to fill them in um, as we go. Uh, I will now pass over to Randis, um, who is uh, the second speaker uh, on our panel today. Um, sorry, my, there we go. Sorry, everyone. Um, so Randis is from the University of Melbourne um, and he's been working in some incredible area ways of transferring the optical and um, technologies that are used for augmented reality, but in putting it in a form factor that actually could be usable, something that's easy to use and easy to um, translate into something that we use every day. So uh, with that, I will pass over to Ranjit and ask him to start his talk. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Jane. Uh, I hope you can hear me. And yep, uh, thank you also, Craig, for the very interesting talk because my original background is in aerospace. And so I could really you know, appreciate what you are doing because I was involved in some interplanetary mission previously. So today I'm going to discuss about, uh, well, talk about, because I'm at home, I use the word to discuss uh, about this next generation augmented reality display. Maybe I'll switch off my video, please, so that uh, there will not be any issue with the band bandwidth. So let me share my screen. Okay, there you go. Yeah, so this work we are doing in collaboration with uh, KDH Design Taiwan and Jarvis Australia. So Jarvis is uh, uh, created by KDH Design to exclusively market their helmet displays. Then we collaborate with the Melbourne Center for Nanofabrication. So I will start with what is augmented reality and virtual reality, because these are the two terms uh, people often come across. Augmented reality, we call it as AR. So AR means you can see, you got a device, that device will be augmenting. Augmenting means you got a virtual image here that will be projected into the real world so that you are, you are interacting with the real world or you are seeing the real world, but the virtual image also is uh, see-through. So that is uh, AR, but VR, Virtual reality means you are fully cut off from the outside world. So you will be fully interacting with the, whatever the app or whatever that you are seeing, you are fully interacting, but you don't have any connection with the outside world. So our interest is in the AR side, augmented reality display. Then what are the challenges? You can see AR started long time ago, but still it is not catching up. Catching up in the sense you can see Google got to Google Glass, Microsoft to HoloLens. Now my, um, Facebook is interested, but there are a lot of challenges. So the common challenges are efficiency of the display, brightness, field of view. Because if you can see, if you have a Google Glass, you move your eyes, then you miss the image. Then virtual reality, there are some resolution, form factor, then virgins accommodation conflict, but we are not looking into virtual reality. Our interest is in the augmented reality. So these are the common issues of augmented reality displays. But when it comes to an application, for example, KDH design is interested in military helmets. So when it comes to a particular application, there will be other challenges that I'll be discussing. So why people are interested in AR and VR technology? So there are so many companies, new companies uh, recently came up with the new products in AR and VR, such as Lumos. Lumos is an Israeli based company. They are, de they are developing excellent uh, AR glasses. So that you can see the trend. So the revenue from less than 5 billion 
it will be going to around 80 billion in only like short period of time. You can see the rise of uh, AR and VR in the market. That is the reason there are so many companies that are interested in the VR and AR technologies, both in software because of image processing and in the hardware, new type of hardware development. So KDH design, so their interest is very specific. So they are interested in motorcycle helmets. They are developing new motorcycle helmet. They are also developing military helmet for Taiwanese military. They are also interested to enter the space market. And so that's a step-by-step. Step. So first they are developing the uh, motorcycle helmet. Then currently they are developing a military helmet and then they will be going into space, space applications. So everybody wanted AR technology, something like this. You can see here is a very thin glass. It's like a normal spectacle. So this is AR technology everyone wanted. But actually the problem is we don't have that type of glass. If you look at the technology in the market, you will see Epson, Google Glasses, HoloLens, Copin Solos, Dream Glass, Lumus. So Lumus is a recent one. So when you look at these, but actually it doesn't look like the previous uh, normal spectacle look. Why? Because it is limited by the existing technology. In the Google Glass, which is uh, most familiar, you can see they have got actually beam splitters. You can see here, they have beam splitters, which create strain to the eyes. And also it is not good for military helmet because of the uh, strain and it is also blocking the views. Another problem with the military helmet is uh, they don't want any technology that is blocking the peripheral view. Peripheral view means on the either side of the eyes. If something is blocking, military is not interested. Also military is not interested if there is a strain in the eye and also something solid that is uh, uh, coming in front of the eyes because that is very dangerous in a combat or if there is a fall or something happens, then uh, the soldier will be injured, not from the enemy, from the air glass itself. And uh, so they also don't want anything covering the top because they already got a, uh, like a dream glass. They already got a lot of electronics these days in their helmet. So they don't want anything uh, on the top. So Lumus is a good technology. Still, they have got uh, uh, the peripheral. So the peripheral blocking region. So that is mainly because of the glass-based technology. So whenever you have a glass display, you have to connect your micro display or projector and optics to the glass. So that's the reason all these technologies you can see, all are blocking the peripheral view. It's bulky on the other side of the eyes because of this reason. So if you look at the technology, how it is working. So most of them uses actually some basic optics like a Google Glass. So this is actually Google Glass. In the Google Glass, what they do is, they have got the display here, micro display. From the micro display, they have got a, actually a cube beam splitter. And then they have got a lens here. So then when you are seeing, this is your eye. So what it does is, uh, the display image is coming and then it is reflected from the lens. Partially, it is going through. And partially, it will be reflecting out. And uh, then it will be magnified and you can see, then same time you can see the outside world. So dream glass, they have got a curved lens so that it will be reflecting. And some other design, they use a hologram. So this is a hologram based design, but there is no product based on the hologram at the moment in the market because hologram based design is still uh, challenging because it is not possible to get the same efficiency for all the colors. This is Lumus. So Lumus recently came up with a new technology in their design. So they will be coupling the light from the side and then they have got multiple mirrors they could insert inside the glass. So the advantage is here, if you got only one glass, then you can see the image here. Because they've got multiple glasses, even if you are moving eye, then you can see through this. Then you can see through this if you are moving the eye. Obviously, there is a discontinuity, but still this is you know, much better in the market at the moment. So this is a technology. Then what is the limitation? As I said, the limitation is you can see, this is uh, the Lumus, Lumus glass, if you take it out. 
and this is a projector and then you have got all the lens part here then it is connected to the glass display so inside the glass it might undergo one reflection and then this is a mirror and from it is reflecting and then when you move your eye you can see maybe from the second one so because of this glass it is not flexible so you should have the projector and optics closer to the display part so you can't uh, avoid this part moving away so that uh, it will look like something like a normal uh, spectacle so then jarvis or kdh designs main interest is moving away this display and optics away from the this this display so this micro display and the projector they want to move away from this uh, this display part near to your eye because then what we can do is we can get rid of this uh, peripheral vision problem it will not be blocking the side views because that is needed for the military helmet then there is also they are interested in the limited eye box or field of view because they don't want the missing the image when the eye is moved a little bit because that is dangerous to use in uh, military application so their focus is these two so there are other issues but they are not much interested poor efficiency they are not going to make a uh, efficient design in the sense they will be using an efficient projector rather than tackling that in the design of the optics and uh, definitely this will not be creating much of the eye strain so the micro display and electronics needed to be moved away from the either side of the eyes see this part should be moved away this part should be moved away then only we can make a uh, ar glass that is pretty much similar to our spectacle and also it will not prevent your uh, peripheral vision but it is not that easy because of the glass based design so then we came up with a recently a new design um, so this is a sketch but the sketch is not for scaling and uh, more information you can see in our recently filed patent which i will show you later so the, our idea is we will be having micro display and optics somewhere here in the frame in the back side then we will be having a flexible wave guide carrying the image all the way up to here then there is a bend and on the glass here we will be depositing a thin layer of uh, pdms again this is also made of pdms so that's uh, what we are interested at the moment pdms based displays then we will be putting air filled uh, pixels i will discuss about that air filled so those are the pixels reflective pixels we make with air filled structures and then reflect into your eyes so that is a design and then we decided to investigate how feasible it is to make such a, uh, a displays then here what we are doing is we are transferring an image through a narrow wave guide all the way up to here so transferring image is actually a big challenge so even if you look at the research recently there was a paper in nature communication so that is a transmission of natural seen images through a multi mode fiber so they have what they have done is they want to transfer image through multi mode fiber because if you got that type of technology this is easy to uh, tackle because then you can you have got a flexible wave guide then you got the display projector here and then you can transfer the image all the way in front of your eyes but then when they have done the experiment definitely this paper is uh, very interesting so what they have found is definitely the fiber here can be flexible multi mode and uh, a few centimeters in length and they could input these type images so at the output of the fiber you can see here see you will be seeing basically speckle then you have to do lot of image processing to get out this image but then you can see this image is not at all good for air application with this this much uh, uh, image processing so the problem here is the core the the fiber got around 100 micrometer core diameter so that can carry around 10000 mode if you don't know the mode so when you have a fiber when you are coupling in something you can couple in different angle so this is a different angle will form different modes so that is the reason it is a very challenging to recover the image and because each mode will be propagating at different velocity and it will uh, mix up the images the image at the output is a speckle actually then you need a rigorous image processing offline because you won't be able to carry that much big processor in your glass to recover these type images so then what we have done is uh, so we will be using 
a bundle actually a flexible bundle and so this is our idea so in the fiber the light is just uh, reflecting light is ca carrying then we want to make a fiber that is kind of carrying image so if you put some input image then if you get the input image back then we also wanted to bend it so that is our idea and then first we thought that definitely if you want to make a flexible uh, display there are a lot of uh, materials but then we thought that uh, uh, we will start with the pdms because some of the pdms technology is well advanced uh, uh, from microfluidics perspective then pdms again you know craig might be interested to see this paper they are also using in space applications these days in a feasibility study how they can use uh, uh, pdms in space so pdms everybody, everybody knows that it's a polydimethyl siloxane and it is a flexible material it is very cheap that's the reason uh, and that is another reason we got interested in this material then so this is the idea that uh, we wanted to try based on the design so we have got a micro display then we got a micro optics and then we got multiple waveguides maybe here i have shown only four and then each one is pdms waveguide you can bend it then in between we'll be putting thin layer of gold around uh, 5 to 10 nanometers and then we'll be making a stack after that what will happen is this all in the pdms matrix and then this thickness will be varying between maybe 2.5 millimeter to maybe 5 millimeter then what what happens is so when you have a tree here for example you got a tree here that is a uh, that is a image you want to project it sorry i will draw it properly so when you have a something like a tree then what will happen is this section will be taking maybe this much part and this much part will be coming here and then through this one the remaining part will be coming through the remaining part will be coming then we will have air filled gap so air filled gap means these are the pixels so you can see here on the right so i don't want to use any mathematical equation obviously these we use rigorous mathematical equations to find out the exact thickness so i am not touching any maths so what the idea is here when the light is coming you can see you got a nano uh, nano nano separation so this is a pdms pdms material and then you got immediately air so that will what will happen is the light will simply reflect but depending upon the angle but that is not just the total internal reflection actually there is also another function that is called the thickness of this uh, air gap so by tuning the thickness and uh, angle even you can keep even angle constant by tuning the thickness you can vary the how much light is reflected and how much is transmitted this way and so that you can make sure that uh, the required light is uh, reflected and at the same time you can also see through it is transparent then we did some simulations after mathematical calculations and uh, uh, so these are some initial simulation results you can see so this is an air field gap in a pdms matrix and we checked how the electric field is uh, propagating using a, a comsol rf module uh, in comsol so you can see we also use optics uh, optics ray optics module and so this one is from rf module so you can see the light is definitely it is reflected by air field we have done a lot of optimization and by seeping the wavelength then we also tried a different air field gap so this is one two three so that we can increase the field of view so that also is uh, we found out to be uh, promising but then we also did the multi-layer simulation uh, with the gold layer there also we can see in the multi-layer we, we did four layers because uh, four layer is uh, computationally less expensive and then we have optimized again the geometry but then uh, we have done uh, studies but then the industries so when we have this idea we, we uh, fabricated some prototype we patented it but then the industry they don't want to straight away fabricate this structure because there are a lot of challenges at the moment uh, when we started the industry wanted to check the first the pdms is a right candidate whether we can use it so that's the reason for any product development we will be starting from the basic first what we have done is uh, we investigate we investigated if the pdms is suitable because our assumption is the pdms is suitable 
then we have to find out some the fabrication strategies using 3d printing and molding because we are also talking with the tpk one company in taiwan they will be mass producing so tpk you might be familiar they make all the touch displays for apple and uh, so we are also talking with them so they want to make sure that whatever the technology we develop is mass producible then we have to design simulate and test both airfield and then we are also trying to find out some other metal metallic pixels which i will discuss so we have to prove the feasibility then we can come back to the multi layer air display so that is the industry driven methodology then first we investigated pdms when we started pdms actually we did not get a good result and we uh, because of the surface roughness when you take a 3d printing and any structure some mold and then you pour the pdms cure it and take it out the problem will be you will have the surface roughness from the 3d printed structure so then we got rid of that uh, surface roughness using some uh, techniques so what we have done is uh, we initially developed some simple structures and in the simple structure we have got a micro display or some object here and then this is we put a 45 degree cut here so this is like a prism cut and then you can see directly some images coming and reflecting so can we make with pdms so e pdms we used to because we engineered the pdms a little bit to suit the application then another second thing what we have done is we have also made a here air filled structures this area only one pixel and also we tried instead of air filled structures some pixelated metal with the nano scale thickness to reflect the image out so these are the two structures initially we uh, fabricated then we move ahead we also did the simulation with the uh, simax because this one is pretty simple uh, structures the problem with these structures is uh, this much this is your display area so your display area is very very small when you are looking but actually that is uh, not a uh, good for air application definitely you will see the image but this area is very very small and uh, if you want to increase area then you have to increase the thickness so because this is a direct reflection of some uh, object from here it's like a mirror then we also got another design so this is our design in our design what we got is we got a wedge shape and from the micro display you can see is coming up yeah from the micro display then uh, the image is using a suitable optics the image is falling here it undergoes multiple reflections and when it undergoes multiple reflection we adjust the optics here in such a way that after each reflection here it is coming here then it is coming here each reflection your image is expanding so that you will see a large image here coming out also this angle is not 45 degree or a prism cut so this angle we adjusted in such a way that each after each reflection what will happen is your critical angle will be decreasing so that uh, the light will come out by itself and uh, so we optimized this geometry we also use this zmax in addition to comsol because comsol functionalities are limited when it comes to ray optics and you can see there is a virtual image formation and these type structures uh, are possible to be used in the ar so the first uh, uh, prototype is the following see you can see we have made a display so the first one is here you can see we coupled light from the mobile phone and then it is coming out same way you can see here i can zoom in you can see the phone arrow we could project it up using this uh, pdm as you can see so, you know so the clarity is uh, more than sufficient for the application then we also made air field structure so these are the air field multi structures inside the pdms and when you make those you can see it is reflecting from here we adjust the air field thickness in such a way that so some will pass through and it can reflect from here again we adjusted the thickness so that some can pass through here and reflect so then this also we proved the air field pixels will work in pdms and we can also get a smooth surface definitely you know it is flexible even after making it several times you can bend it but still the display will work and then this is one of the designs uh, military helmet uh, uh, the other designs you know we can't uh, uh, present in public so this is one of the basic designs uh, using that type display so this is a helmet and the micro display and electronics are here and then this is that uh, wave guide pdms based and then uh, here is the image coming out so we developed an end to end uh, uh, prototype so this display this part 
also got a lot of other applications like in air glasses car displays motorcycle helmet window displays these type of designs can be used yeah so the design would look like something like this one of the designs this is one of the designs where instead of uh, air filled structures we can also use uh, pixelated metal so in this structure we have used a pixelated metal so here we can use uh, air filled structures or pixelated structures so here we proved uh, air filled structures are working now what we wanted to know is uh, if we don't use uh, air filled structures can we use a pixelation so many pixels using nano scale metal because nano scale thick metal is uh, say transparent uh, if we can tune with the thickness and so this is one of the geometries and so you can we did the cmax simulation you can see and these are some pixels then we also studied the uh, pixel thickness the metal film we used gold and aluminum so this is uh, uh, with gold so we varied the pitch and the size size of the pixels and also the thickness of the metal to tune the transmission and reflection so then what we have got is so we can also do the simulation in comsol yeah you will be interested in these samples so these are some of the samples uh, the display samples uh, we have developed and you can see some of the experiments definitely these are the covid my, my group member was doing some experiment at home so this is a projected projected image and then this is a image from the display so another one what we have done is this is one of the uh, best examples so this is actually the display so in the display when you see here so this is a wedge wedge shape and uh, in the wedge shape you can see this is a background the mountain that is from a screen and then there is no object here so this is a place where we will be coupling the object even without any uh, optics when you put an op image object here then it is coming up you can see here and that is uh, overlapping with uh, the mountain here so at the same time transparent at the same time the image can come up and then another one is uh, the the spectacle that we discussed and uh, in that one what we have done is we have designed a wave guide in that wave guide what you can see is uh, um, sorry yeah sorry i think uh, there were some technical issues yep and uh, so the so the idea is when we are putting the display here the light should be coming all the way and then coming out so then we have to test whether the bent waveguide will work in the bent waveguide again it's not a direct reflection of the light so the direct is, we will be having a wedge shape here then the image will be reflected under multiple reflection and then it is coming and then it's coming out so this is a display that we have made this is the design yeah you can see the characterization and uh, so this is uh, this is how the display looks with the size and we can couple images in different angles so you can couple uh, maybe one angle like this so that the image will be going like this under multiple reflection and then we also developed here not only 45 degree bend we got a multiple bend so that this light can be reflected and then here we will be putting air field so at the moment it is a 45 degree cut but here we will be having the pixelated array so that is a, a device a next generation device so using this one you can see you can see actually we coupled that google g from without any optics we just put it here some display and then the image came all the way and then bent through and it came out so then this is a, this is basically the covid research covid research is the research that we carried out this year and uh, it was a good uh, we got very good result and you can see because of the limited time i don't want to you know over uh, run the time so this is a patent maybe you can look at uh, light guiding apparatus and guiding method therefore so it's a provisional patent filed in 2020 by kdh group and uh, university of melbourne so maybe i'll conclude there uh, so the conclusion is uh, engineered pdms is a promising candidate for flexible air applications and uh, we have used this one for making a military helmet first generation military helmet and uh, uh, also pdms is a promising material actually in the optic side if you want to make any prototype even if the pdms is not used in the final design 
uh, still you can use this uh, PDMS molding technique to check some uh, proof of concept. Because when, we, when it comes to mass production, we are not sure we will be using a liquid plastic or PDMF because we have to check with, we are still discussing with the TPK1 company. And then we also will be making the multi-layer web guide with several layers like a fiber, that development is under progress. And we are waiting actually to come this uh, new leaf grant to the product installed at the MCN. The grant was uh, awarded. This is a nano 3D printer. Using that, we can easily make that uh, air-filled nanostructures. Also, when you have multiple layers, there will be challenges in stacking, precise stacking. So we will be getting a new equipment from Ficontact Germany for micro pick and place. So this equipment already is in Australia, but not installed uh, because of the COVID. The engineer has to come from Germany. So some of the acknowledgements, uh, especially MCN facilities and uh, MCN staff assistance, uh, much appreciated, especially in the lockdown, like Hamed, Rick, John, Dan, and other people, my group members, Yajin, Sinhi, and Bryce, and KDH team and also uh, funding from KDH, we acknowledge. And thank you. Uh, well, thank you very much. Uh, that has just been an incredible uh, way of thinking about optics and how we can bend things to our will. Um, so thank you very much for um, that amazing <laughs> primer on all things augmented reality and how we can use something as simple as PDMS to make it all much, much better. Um, unfortunately, um, we have run over time, so I'm going to um, leave it there. Um, unfortunately, so no time for questions for Ranjith, but if anyone does have any um, questions that they want or they would like to get in contact, please let us know and we'll make, make connections. So it just leaves me to say thank you to our speakers, Ranjeth and Craig, for talking to us about space and defense applications that we can that we enable here through ANFF. If you do have any other questions or you want to make contact, just contact the ANFF office and we will make those connections for you. And please do feel free to join us next week where we're going to be talking about um, communications and cyber security and how the different types of electronics and and um, ways of moving information around can be helped by what ANFF does here and, and around the country. So once again, thank you to Craig, thank you to Ranjas, and thank you to all of you for attending today. <laughs>